who, since uh, she was an Army brat and actually was in the Army herself, went to medical school in San Antonio, did a residency in Galveston and a fellowship, and now she's on the faculty in uh, Baylor uh, in Houston, and she's going to give us the latest and greatest about what we don't know about obesity and pregnancy. <laughs> Ooh, what a t yeah, I was going to say that's a tough charge because from everything I've heard so far, y'all, um, really know a lot actually so um, but again so it's kind of a mix of people let me ask really quickly um, actually let me get the housekeeping out of the way um, so again um, really I don't have any commercial disclosures um, I am a Texas Medical Board reviewer um, my only other um, admission before we get started though just so you all know my biases is that I'm a self-admitted addict towards surf certain foods you know, um, when you get to the bottom of the bag of the salt and vinegar chips and you see aceto white changes in your mouth and you're thinking of cold flow clinic, it is time to stop and put the bag down. And if you were to take this away from me though, I might actually, I might actually like bring out the old Sergeant Fox and, you know, be a little um, injurious. But, um, but again, I, you know, I'm also among those people who have really close friends and family members who are obese and I've been obese before. You know, when we talk about actual medical BMI standards, you know, um, four times in my mind, in my life, um, you know, during each pregnancy, I'm kind of naturally overweight, but um, during each pregnancy, and when I, I lived in Germany for a year, and let me tell you, the beer and the bread will put on the pounds really quickly. So, um, anyhow, but um, so I have my objectives up here. You know, again, just talk about some of the intrinsic and extrinsic and extrinsic factors that help contribute to obesity. Because I think if we understand kind of what is fueling it a little bit, you know, everybody has their own opinions, but um, it kind of hel helps us deal with our patients and deal with their own individual dilemmas and their journeys. Um, but also motivate you all to refer your patients and counsel them about options for lifestyle changes in weight management, uh, whether it's lifestyle or surgery, um, to help them um, reduce the risks of chronic disease. Um, counsel the patients and their families accurately and compassionately about problems with obesity, especially in pregnancy, and develop multidisciplinary strategies within inpatient and outpatient settings to care for these patients, a lot of which you've probably already done. But are there any really burning questions that you all have out there? Again, I've heard that you all have, again, a, again just like Texas, a pretty heavy population and a good number of people who are obese, and I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. No? Okay. All right. Well, I'll get started. So again, you know, when we're talking about obesity, you know, it's really funny. We were, you know, we've all talked about how, you know, maybe 10 years ago, you'd, you know, somebody would have to be over 300 pounds before you'd even consider, you know, somebody being obese, and it's pretty rare. But um, it's absolutely obesity is absolutely on the rise. Um, it, you know, all, over 30 percent of adults are obese. So we're talking about a BMI of equal to or greater than 30. And when we're talking about different classes of obesity, class one, class two, class three, class three being um, a BMI of 40 or greater, um, that's about 8% of um, adult women or of reproductive age. And you notice here that, um, you know, at all age groups, if we're talking about women at all age groups, we've got a pretty high um, incidence. So again, um, about 60% of women are overweight, and this is actually rising, and we're now like at about 75% of women, people who are both either overweight or um, obese. 40% of pregnant women are either overweight or obese, 20% are obese at the time they become pregnant, and about 8% are severely obese. Um, and this, you know, again, this varies um, from state to state. So this is an image of a heat map from the CDC that looks at the rates of obesity state by state um, over time. And so as the colors get you know, more in the hot range, the red range, that's a higher percentage of, of the population that is obese. And so if we just look at things over time, I picked 1988 because that's when I graduated from high school. I figured it was pretty fitting. And look, you know, Oregon, where I grew up, Louisiana, where I've got family and where we are today, blissfully unaware of what was going on in 1988. But, uh, but let's see what happens over time, if this will work here. Okay, so yeah, as, as the years go on, peop, you know, more and more percentage of the population is becoming obese. Oh yeah, Louisiana just hit over 30%. There goes Texas. And if you look as, um, you know, after 2010, there's not a single state in the nation where the incidence of obesity is less than 20%. And yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty telling. Things are changing for sure. Um, this is another um, 
table that looks kind of at some of the same data over time, but this just starts at 20, uh, 2003. But it's also looking at, again, um, very young individuals, less than two years old, including uh, babies, childhood obesity. And I think the only thing that's a little bit, you know, you know, potentially optimistic, if we want to be optimists about this, is that, again, when we're looking at changes in obesity from early 2000s into the later 2000s, you know, the, the rate of um, high birth weight for length went down just a little bit, as did some of the values for childhood obesity. Um, and again, you know, if you think about what's been going on, there's been a lot of um, push toward improving uh, nutrition in schools. If we can't target the adults who are so set in their ways, maybe we can get to the kids, right? So maybe this will change things a little bit. Um, but again, adult obesity has kind of still been on the rise slowly but surely. Um, okay, so when we think about obesity, um, you know, you hear different things kind of thrown around. Oh, it's a disease of just affluent nations, not developing countries. It's kind of associated with poverty and low socioeconomic status. Would you agree? Maybe, yeah. Um, maybe people who aren't as well educated. But the most recent data is actually kind of countering that a little bit. Um, a majority, this is a chart, um, again, from the CDC and the National Health Service um, that looks at economic status. And there's actually a much larger percentage of people who are obese who have income that's within the normal range or at the upper end of the pay scale compared to people who are really well below the poverty level. So when you look at just sheer numbers, um, and that's across all ethnicities, um, and it's changing over time. Um, so sometimes we, we do think about, you know, there is some evidence suggesting that maybe you're socioeconomically disadvantaged and so you don't have the transportation to get to a grocery store to buy healthier foods. You know, and they actually have really interesting um, maps from the USDA that can kind of show you these very same things. So, but again, uh, this particular map is just looking at inability to access a grocery store. Like there's these huge, when you look here, again, the darker the color, the um, more difficult it is to get to a grocery store. And you notice that a lot of these areas are pretty rural areas that are on this map. But you notice there are still some places within you know, Texas, Louisiana, including, this looks kind of close to Caddo Parish. Um, yeah, sure enough, um, that where 30 to 100 percent of the, the population within this parish have difficulty getting to a grocery store. And uh, again, about a, a, just under a half of the people um, who report that are also of low income, but this, this encompasses all income levels. Yet, oh look, but there's a ton of fast food restaurants. So this may actually play into the, the problem as well. If it's a lot easier to get to the McDonald's or to the corner store and you may not have um, fresh food options, it gets a lot easier to choose something that may not be as healthy. And by the way, it tastes really good too. So, um, so, so anyhow, you know, from time to time, I've I've seen patients who will who will say, "I just cannot afford to eat healthfully." I would argue, you know, rice and beans is awfully cheap and probably healthier than what you can buy at the corner store. But if you can't get to it, that's a certain problem. And these um, these areas are actually called food deserts um, for a reason because really people have a hard time getting um, the healthy food that they need um, to eat a, a well-rounded diet. Um, so, you know, we were, we were mentioning that sometimes it may be an issue with educational status. Well, interestingly, you know, no matter what um, decade we're looking at here, um, it's not always the case. Now, for women, interestingly, if you notice this chart, here are the college graduates, some college, high school, less than high, you know, less than high school education. Yeah, for women, across time, women who are, have more education tend to have less obesity. But notice that that's still on the increase um, t from the 2000s compared to the uh, late 80s and early 90s across all educational levels. Now for men, the association is just unclear. So, you know, whether you've got college education, some college, look, in fact, now the people with some college are a little heavier than the people with less education. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so again, so why is this a big deal? Other than the fact that we kind of know, and it's you know frustrating for us as practitioners, but there is a real cost to obesity. Um, in 2013, morbid obesity, we're talking a BMI of greater than or equal to 35, and that's a huge spectrum, let's don't, not forget. But there are estimates that it costs $69 billion in healthcare dollars. 
which accounted for 60% of total obesity-related costs. So again, this is a, we're talking about maybe you know a small proportion of people with obesity who need the most resources um, for their care. And severe obesity cost state Medicaid programs almost $8 billion a year, ranging from $5 million in Wyoming to $1.3 billion in California. And I've got another map of these costs. Now, you were mentioning earlier that, gosh, you wish Louisiana Medicaid would just pay for bariatric surgery. I think this is the argument right here. Obesity care for all of the complications that go along with it, the cost might be reduced if we can take care of the problem. Um, interestingly, when we look at this map, though, I want to point out a couple things. Um, because why such a wide variation in costs? Could it be that there are some states that are willing to pay for such things and other states that aren't? I'd argue probably so. Um, now, you know, and again, why does, it, why does it apply to us as OBGYNs? Just like most other things in healthcare, there's higher spending for women compared to men. And again, um, the, this group, the Wang et al, that were talking about these health affairs and the costs of obesity, their conclusion was that access to cost-effective and efficacious obesity care needs to be a part of strategies to reduce spending in Medicaid programs, just like performing bariatric surgery. So he, yeah, here's that map from the same article, um, looking at per capita, capita obesity rate, rate healthcare expenditures in 2013. And notice, again, Pacific Northwest, where I grew up, you know, it's a little crunchy, it's a little granola, there's a lot of health food choices when you go out to restaurants. Um, a lot of, you know, people run, you think of Oregon track. Um, they spent a lot per capita on obesity. Is it because there's more obesity? Well, not if we go back to that heat map that shows the incidence of obesity, but they're spending more. Whereas Texas, where we know there's a pretty high rate, Louisiana, where from what I'm hearing, y'all have a pretty high rate of obesity, they're spending kind of middle of the road, and there's other states that are spending even less. So again, I think I, my, my deduction, and this is not evidence-based, is it may have to do somewhat with policy and what people tolerate. So there are some people who, again, really adamantly believe, hey, people have choices, and if you choose to eat every meal, a supersized Big Mac, and watch TV all day, well, that's your choice. So let's, let's break down some assumptions, because again, you know, okay, quick poll, you don't have to raise your hand. Who has ever had that discussion of, does this make my butt look fat? Either as the asker or the recipient, right? Okay, yeah, it's pretty universal. So there's some definite, I mean, this is, a, this is a touchy subject, right? Whether you're the physician or you're the patient or yes, the partner, I mean, you know. Okay, so some assumptions, you know, all of these things that we're talking about when we're talking about obesity, it's not absolute weight necessarily. It is BMI that people refer to. It's a surrogate that's used in um, our studies and in medicine. But BMI, what is it? It's kilograms divided by meters squared. Right? It is not equal to body fat percentage, which is very, very different. So these are some pictures of people with pretty equal BMIs who have a different percentage of body fat. And each one of these people has a different risk ratio, right? So this person, I throw her in the deep end of the pool, she is in trouble. <laughs> this person might have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, right? Or maybe she's anorexic and not menstruating and can't get pregnant. Let's be a little more realistic here. <laughs> I won't be mean, right? Okay. Don't shame anybody, right? So, so BMI is a surrogate. And then the other thing is to notice this, right? And we're, we'll talk about this when we're talking about approaches to surgery. Fat does not distribute evenly. Like here, this lady's got a little more hips and a little less belly. This lady's got a little more belly. Same here. You know, there's, so it affects what we do differently. So it's hard to uh, treat a equal BMI as just one thing. Yeah, or, you know, I love this one from, yeah, the very highly um, cited medical site, popsugar.com. But looking at, um, you know, this is what your patients will understand. That's why I like it. Um, you know, if we look at celebrities' estimated BMIs, you know, who knows if they're real, but Arnold Schwarzenegger, guess what? He's obese. He's probably got a low body fat percentage. Well, it's changed over time, but yeah. Tom Cruise, overweight. Um, yeah, The Rock, also obese. Because again, it's um, kilograms divided by meters squared. Yeah. Um, so some other assumptions, okay, yeah, everybody kind of has a, an opinion of what people should do to lose weight, right? So there, this was actually a really nice um, uh, commentary about how to promote public health in the context of the obesity epidemic. Incidentally, this has become such a, a nation, not just nationwide, but a global e epidemic that in the medical literature, they have coined the term globesity. So we now have a, you know, a compound word. I can't, apparently I can't number here. Bear with me, that's okay. 
who knows? It's a, a, I, I blame the, uh, I blame the uh, PowerPoint. But, um, but truly, like, people will say, okay, so let's, you just need less calories in. Yes, that is a part of the simple answer. But in the long term, restrictive diets don't work when people really restrict their calories. You know, yes, they will lose some weight in the short term, which is great. But even though you shrink those fat cells and you lose weight, all of the hormones that help regulate appetite, things like ghrelin, leptin, neuropeptide Y, those never quite go back to normal. So you really, those patients who are telling you, I am starving, even though you know they've just had their nutrition. I mean, that psychological drive is still there to eat more. Um, and so there's evidence too that if you get overly restrictive, uh, if you've got those patients who are on the you know, slim fast diet, my husband likes to call that slim slow, um, doesn't really work. Um, because again, you know, our bodies are, 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 are programmed, and we, we're fighting millions of years of evolutions. We, we are programmed to survive and avoid starvation. So, okay, let's, let's go back to how things used to be. Let's stigmatize it. It's a sin, gluttony is a sin, right? I mean, if we go back to the biblical times, you know, ooh, it's a big deal. Um, but really, ultimately, when we really start fat shaming, um, pe people get demoralized. Pe there are some very nice articles talking about how people will not go seek gynecologic oncology screening because they are afraid that their doctors are gonna, you know, um, be ugly to them because they're fat. Um, and just because somebody's normal weight does not mean that they have good health. There are plenty of people who are thin, who have poor muscle mass, they might be malnourished, um, they may still have cardiovascular disease or hypertension. Um, so we'll get into this a little bit later. So there are a lot of people who really um, cling to this and say, so we should be health healthy at any size, let's focus on that. I would say yes to a degree with some caveats. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. The other, the other thing is, let's assume all overweight people must want to lose weight. It's so terrible. Oh, you know, you're, this, life is so hard for you. You, you. Surely you must want to lose weight. There are a lot of people who don't. I'm happy, I'm content, I'm productive. Stop bugging me, I like my, I like my cake. All right. Um, and again, all normal or underweight individuals are content with your, their weight. Absolutely not. I had a patient not too long ago. She'd even undergone bariatric surgery, lost almost 200 pounds. I thought she looked fantastic. She was devastated because she could not lose the final 10 that she had originally planned to lose. And now she was pregnant, so now she's gonna gain it all back. She was, it was so for her, it was absolutely a, um, a you know, pre-conceptualized stigma for her. So, so there really is a burden of weight stigma that kind of affect, that impacts the care that we give and also how receptive our patients are, right? Of course, in, in taking care of our patients who are overweight or obese, if you cannot connect with your patient or if they even sense that you feel uncomfortable or that you're judging them. I mean, it's, again, it's that sensitive topic of, does this make my butt look big? Um, it can really start to impact how they um, perceive your care. So um, there is actually, again, like I said, this um, association for size, diversity, and health. I think the, um, the concept behind this is actually really um, a good one in the sense of, you know, you have to meet your patient where they are. You cannot expect everybody to be of normal size or to get there immediately or to know how to, go, how to get there, right? They are who they are. So let's accept them for who they are. But um, so th this group's principles are that there should be acceptance and respect for all shapes and sizes, sure. Improved access um, to healthcare for individual needs, absolutely. Healthcare centered on respect, not stigma, sure. Life enhancing movement, meaning exercise, yes. Eating for well-being, yes. Those are all very good goals. Um, and so, you know, I, I do like these questions too. Are you weight biased? Have you ever made negative comments about your or others' weight? Probably most of us have at some point, right? Thought that fat people were lazy, lack self-control, or are, are unloved? Some are, probably some are not, right? Of course. Assume someone should lose or gain weight. This is where we as practitioners kind of get into trouble because yes, we will, there's a lot of us who will say, you really do need to lose five to 10% of your weight. And I, I'm still gonna stick with this one. Yeah, there are some people who probably would be a healthier, individual if they lost a little bit of weight. Thought that skinny was the ultimate goal. This is, I think, something that is reasonable to combat and thought that a skinny person had an eating disorder. Not all skinny people are anorexic. So again, in just interesting to challenge our own biases. And again, there's also research showing that yes, we as doctors, more than half of physicians admit that they think less of their overweight patients. Again, hopefully this is changing. But so let me ask you really quickly. I'm going to throw a couple, you know, folks out here now. Again, based on the patients who you've been seeing, 253 pounds with a BMI of 42 might not seem that big anymore, right? 
Right, it's normal now, right? Okay, what about this 24-year-old G1P0 who's 495 pounds prior to pregnancy and has a 30-pound weight gain? <sighs> you kind of sigh a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, well, so let's just, you know, I mean, just kind of picture in your mind. I'm not going to ask you to tell me what you think, but just think about things that you've heard or you might have, might have even thought, you know? And we've all done it from time to time. Um, so this patient, BMI 42, she had maintained a 400-pound weight loss. She was 700 pounds but got bariatric surgery. So how can I not be proud of her? I think that's awesome. Yeah, she's got a BMI 42, but she's probably never going to have a BMI of 25. That's okay. She's much healthier than she was before. Um, or this young lady. Again, she's 24. She is one of these patients, incidentally, who absolutely just love to eat. She, even on the delivery table, she was talking to her baby. She was as nice as she is big, talking to her baby about how she's going to have a little chicken wing, and daddy's going to have a half a chicken, and she's going to have a whole chicken, and it's going to be a great family meal. But, you know, she was very open about it. But, again, she delivered a healthy, appropriately grown, not large for gestational age baby. She did not have diabetes. She has a master's in public health and works as a legal aide. She's not dumb, she's not lazy, but boy did I hear her family members just look her straight in the face and say, oh my God, you are fat. You are so fat. So, so here's, here's kind of some things that I learned from these patients, not just these patients, other patients as well, but like some of the ones I've talked to you about before, but, um, and there's actually evidence to show this too, I didn't quote this study, but, but women who are heavy know they are. It is not, you know, it's not like you're going to say, oh, did you know you're overweight? <clears throat> yes. And, and actually, overweight and obese women tend to overestimate their BMI if they're just asked to guess it. So, um, so again, once you kind of realize that, I think, and, and realize that, you know, people are very capable and they have their own desires, like this lady, you know, their own comfort level, I think it's very easy just to have a really open conversation and start the discussion with, so how do you feel about your weight? What, do, what are you interested in? What are your goals for your health? And if you start there, then it doesn't become this confrontation of, wow, you've got to be my of 70 and you have got to lose some weight now. Because guess what, too, when you're pregnant, that's going to be hard, right? What is, okay, by the way, how many of your patients come to you before they get obese? <laughs> yeah, so we're kind of starting behind the eight ball, right? Which is why, again, we do need a more, um, you know, public health movement to help kind of, you know, tackle this problem. But, but just starting with somebody and saying, oh, yeah, you know, by the way, your BMI is, you know, 70. Let's get you on this plan. They're, they might just say, yeah, no. <laughs> but, but again, you can, you can kind of meet them halfway. And, you know, again, when, it's t when we're talking about behavioral changes that will help people be healthier, sometimes you've got to start small and then work your way big. So um, again, another big assumption, I think I mentioned it before, but excess calories and excess weight does not equal adequate nutrition. So I love this um, uh, visual aid by sparkpeople.com, which is incidentally a free resource that your patients can use if they want to start to try to eat better. Um, so it, this not only shows you know, that argument for how, like the argument that I just can't afford to eat well, guess what, if you're going to your fast food joint for $20, you can get this much food, or you can buy this much food at the grocery store. Probably gonna feed more people and, and keep you full longer. Same thing here, if you can get to the grocery store, right? And notice this is Walmart, right? We're not talking high-end grocery store, it doesn't need to be groceries. Um, but so, so the, other, the other issue too is just because somebody's overweight or of normal weight, it doesn't mean that they necessarily have adequate nutrition. And so um, Dr. Cooper actually asked me, I know she couldn't be here, but she asked me, so how, can, how do you bill for anything extra when you're taking care of somebody who's obese? If they're malnourished, sure, you can actually code for malnourishment. Oftentimes I will run, um, you know, I'm not doing universal screening for all vitamin deficiencies like, uh, like the Society for Endocrinology might like us to do. But again, especially if I have a patient who I know might have an increased risk for surgery, maybe it's somebody who's had two prior C-sections um, or has a breech baby, I might check a microalbumin level. And if it's super low, there's some evidence that maybe they're not getting the adequate nutrition that they need. Um, Again, so what, what is part of what's leading to this dilemma? You know, we are, like I mentioned before, we are absolutely designed to avoid starvation. And so we are, you know, our brain rewards us for eating food that is calorie dense. So um, there was a very elegant study done um, using 32 volunteers. All of them had to be overweight. Now, this is not morbidly obese, but a little bit overweight. And they completed a binge eating scale. How often do you eat? How much do you eat? They had to have at least moderate binge eating behavior. Um, 26 of the participants completed the study successfully. They actually had functional MRI studies of the brain. 
they, I, I like these little PowerPoint straws that they put in here, but they were given a little water, a little um, soda to drink, a little high calorie sweet stuff to see what happened, and they would either drink it or just taste it, wash it out, and you know they'd rate their experience. And interestingly, using um, functional MRI um, and looking at the signals that occur in different brain regions, those brain regions directly associated with reward, emotion, um, lit up. Um, and again, those especially that um, are associated with governing emotional responses lit up more strongly um, for the people who have um, higher binge eating behavior. So those people who eat emotionally have difficulty controlling things, they absolutely had a different structure in their brain and a different response. So um, again, those, those, those feelings that patients might talk to you about of like, I just can't stop, it's real. Um, and this is very similar to the types of um, brain stimulation that people get when they're using drugs or engaging in gambling, things like that. Because again, remember, we've all got our own um, endorphins and encephalins that circulate and are very powerful, rewarding. Now, this is actually from my research as a fellow. I was actually looking at nicotine exposure in utero and how that affected behavior. And uh, so, as, again, as a reward model, I was trying to use the sugar water to see if maybe the nicotine exposed pups or the, you know, the babies were you know, trying to give themselves more reward or seek more reward. It turns out that really there wasn't too much difference between the two groups for this aspect of behavior. But when it comes to having a solution, an 8% weight per volume solution of sucrose, all of a sudden notice what happens. Like, you know, the mice are drinking about the same amount of water every day, no matter what the solution, but boy, you get it sweet enough, they want to drink a whole lot more. And the same thing was for males. So, you know what this is kind of close to? Soda, which is about 12% sucrose solution. So again, um, this has been uh, shown also in human studies that we really do like sugar. Um, so much so that food companies have caught on to this and they actually have food engineers, biochemists and things who will sit there and um, talk about how to develop new food products that people will like really well. Um, and it's amazing, they've developed this thing called the bliss point, which is that point of that, that appropriate combination of salt, sugar and fat where you just really want more. Um, a food designed to addict. And so interestingly, this is you know, a quote from um, Michael Mudd, the CEO of Kraft Foods, that as a culture, we've become upset by tobacco companies advertising to children, but we sit idly by while the food companies do the very same thing. And we could make a claim that the toll taken on public health by poor diet rivals that by tobacco. That's from a food CEO from Kraft, which is incidentally owned by Philip Morris, right? Um, and it's, it's nicely, if you ever have interest in that kind of um, aspect of it, it's in this book by um, Michael Moss. Okay, so again, um, so one of the things that we can actually encourage our patients to do is eat more fresher foods. I mean, it's, again, it's so beautifully simple, right? Just eat foods that's not processed. It is a little harder, yes, you have to make it. <laughs> but guess what, now there's like a bazillion Pinterest apps that are free that have recipes galore. It makes it very, very easy as long as you just do it. Um, so what about exercise? Um, again, one of the you know, complaints is, well, I don't have a trainer. It costs a lot of money. I don't have the money to go to a gym. But guess what? One of the most effective exercise mechanisms for weight management is walking. And there are a couple of studies that showed this really, really well. Um, a lot of them are um, done by D.R. Bassett, actually, interestingly. But um, this 2010 study showed that, on average, Americans take a, just over 5,000 steps a day in our normal daily activities when wearing a pedometer. And that is significantly less than people in other countries where obesity is still a problem, but not as, as um, widespread as it is in the US. If we look at an old order Amish community, you know, they don't rely on technology so much, they take well over that. We're talking, you know, 18,000 steps a day, seven, you know, 14,000 steps a day. And again, they're in, they do have overweight individuals, but they don't have obese individuals in their, in their group. Because remember again, this is based on BMI, so maybe they're more muscular if they're actually working and working in the fields and raising houses and stuff. Um, and interestingly, when they looked at further studies, so how much, how much walking does it really take to help lead to weight loss or help reverse some of the problems that are associated with obesity, like chronic hypertension, diabetes? 10,000. Anybody have a Fitbit? What is the pre-programmed goal? goal? 10,000 steps a day, and this is where that comes from. But again, I think a lot of us are aware that exercise alone does not lead to significant weight loss, and it requires a combination of dietary changes and exercise along with other things. So now one of the big focuses on trying to understand weight gain and weight loss is actually the microbiome. These are, you know, again, the bacteria that live in our intestinal systems, on our flora. 
Um, we easily harbor over one trillion bacteria within our bodies. And there are definite links between our intestinal floral imprint, what bacteria live there, and different aspects of health and disease. Um, this has been looked at when we're, we're talking about antibiotic use and overweight, whether or not um, people should have cesareans versus vaginal delivery. There's some um, uh, evidence, you know, it's not direct causation, but suggesting that if a um, neonate is not delivered through the vaginal canal, that they miss that initial inoculation with the maternal um, microbes. And again, the, there are definite differences when looking at obese and non-obese individuals, whether it's adults or children, that the bacteria that live in the guts of children who are obese are different than those who are not. And again, um, there is some very interesting um, evidence that we can alter our intestinal microbiome by altering the diet. If you switch to either a low-carb or low-fat diet, different bacteria will thrive. Um, so this is some research that was done by um, one of my colleagues at, at Baylor, Dr. Agard, looking at a maternal high-fat diet. I think this is one of the most um, impressive studies to date, too. It act actually suggests, too, that not only can we change the microbial, um, uh, microbial flora when we change our diet, but it actually persists in the offspring to some degree. Now, this is a little bit reversible. If you, for example, if you, as a mother, these were actually um, uh, macaques that were studied, have a high-fat diet, your babies will have a different, and you breastfeed your babies, these babies will have a different grouping of bacteria. Um, but interestingly, the postnatal diet can alter back. So these um, blue and green dots were the um, babies that were essentially um, fed a high-fat diet versus a control diet. These little, green, these little green dots here were the um, babies that originally had a control diet and then ate a high-fat diet. Um, and interesting, you'll notice that um, when these orange here, they had a high-fat diet and went to control diet. So the lower end of this particular graph, these, um, these offspring had an intestinal floor that was more associated with obesity that changed and normalized to be much more like the offspring that had had only a control diet, whether in utero, during breastfeeding, or afterward. So again, it normalized a little bit, but babies that were um, uh, fed by high-fat eating dams and then had a high-fat diet had the worst outcomes of all. They had the most de deleterious appearing changes um, of, of all of the groups. So again, if you think about it, if you've got an obese mom and then you, they continue with the behaviors that are learned in um, you know, when you're talking about nature and nurture or eating a very high-fat diet, there's a potential that those um, individuals will have even more problems with obesity and um, long-term health issues. So again, what interventions can we do? Again, now one of the issues is to, you know, this is a huge problem. If you think about all the things that I've, I've kind of mentioned before, it seems like we are up against a mountain, right? Literally and figuratively. Um, I've heard from a lot of providers that a lot of people are just, you know, I don't have time in my clinic to talk about these things. It takes a huge amount of support to really create long lifestyle changes. Well, but patients actually put a whole lot of um, stock into what their doctors tell them is a helpful behavior. When you talk about people quitting smoking, they are much more likely to quit if their doctor told them to quit. So there is value in, again, still having that conversation about, you know, you'd be healthier if you could lose 5% of your body weight. So where do you, where do you turn to? And interestingly, um, although Medicaid does not pay for bariatric surgery, they're at least providing some reimbursement for up to six visits in a primary care physician's office specifically targeted to weight management. That's a lot better than it was five or 10 years ago. So again, dietary modification and restriction, we mentioned before that's not always helpful, but it can lead to weight loss. Um, and the goal, again, is not to become skinny. It's to have 5 to 10% weight loss. So that's not a whole lot. Even that can um, reduce your incidence of hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Now, the limitations, of course, of all of these lifestyle modifications are that many obese people still will regain some back, um, up to two-thirds of patients. And sometimes they will go back to baseline to their um, original weight within five years, unless they're able to maintain the behaviors. And that's the thing that is really key. It's not something that you can ju just expect to change for two weeks and then have it change. You really have to be able to sustain the lifestyle changes in order to persist with weight control. Um, exercise. What can they do? Again, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be walking around the mall, although they might be tempted by the food court. Um, uh, but again, we're talking about a goal starting at 175 minutes per week 
advancing to 200 minutes per week and maintaining with 200 to 300 minutes a week. Again, so we're kind of asking them to like, oh yeah, so you made this goal, great, work harder. That kind of goes against our reward system, right? Um, behavioral intervention, these are those one-on-one -on -one, um, sessions where you get counseling about how to modify behaviors. How do you control emotional eating? How do you journal? How do you log your um, food intake? Um, and again, this is reasonably effective. Um, pharmacologic interventions, things like um, uh, some of the medications that are available. Now again, big caveat, we can't use those in MFM because our patients are pregnant for the most part, but um, there is evidence that use of these medications as an adjunct for behavioral modification and lifestyle changes can lead to greater weight loss and greater sustained weight loss. But again, the data is really limited for long-term control. How are people gonna be maintained on these medications forever? Probably not. And again, surgical interventions such as uh, bariatric surgery. Of all of these interventions, this is the one that has the greatest likelihood of long-term sustained weight loss, even up to 10 years, and of uh, major weight loss. However, again, access to um, uh, surgery, the cost, and the risks inherent to surgery are all barriers to care. Um, again, now when we talk to you about um, long-term maintenance, this is one of those because the maintenance, because the weight loss is so great and because the maintenance is so good, there's very good evidence showing also improved health outcomes, reduction in cardiovascular disease, reduction in hypertension, reduction in diabetes, better pregnancy outcomes for the most part, Redu reduction in uh, preeclampsia, uh, low, uh, uh, reduced risk of macrosomia. Um, According to the United States National Weight Control Registry, which is a nice registry that was started in about 1993, there are some characteristics of patients uh, that are common for people who maintain their weight loss. And so again, when you're talking to your patients, you can say, if you're one of these patients who does these behaviors, you're much more likely to maintain your weight loss. Eating breakfast every day, high levels of volitional activity, meaning you gotta move, you gotta exercise. Reduce your fat intake, don't consume, um, empty calories like sodas that don't have any um, uh, value. Um, so low or no calorie beverages to, re to reduce total caloric intake. These pe are the people who continue to have a little dietary restraint. Even though they might want something really big, they actually will kind of sit there and plan and manage their, their dietary intake. And they decrease their television washing time to less than 10 hours per week, which is significantly lower. If you think about what we, you know, what the American Academy of Pediatrics says for kids, less than three hours a day of screen time, that's a lot less than that still. So, you know, we need to set a good example for our kids and our patients. And again, I'm gonna include this list that you can refer to later of relatively low cost or free resources that are available to patients. Now, again, a lot of these are online or have applications, so they do need to have some access. But again, things like smartphones are becoming so much more universal, even, in people, even for people who may have otherwise limited access to care that it is still an option. Okay, so what about pregnancy? Interestingly, all these are um, pictures of fertility goddesses, and not one of them looks skinny. <laughs> so um, the Institute of Medicine weight gain recommendations were modified in 2009. And we have a very nice um, you know, listing of what, you know, where people start in pregnancy and how much weight they should gain until you get to obesity. And really, it's kind of uniform. So this is an area open for research and that may change. And there is some research showing that for people who are moderately to severely obese, that even some modest weight loss may not be harmful in pregnancy. It may reduce the risk of preeclampsia, um, high um, uh, a need for uh, C-section and uh, macrosomia. Um, but again, we, that has to be done safely. The concern is always that if we're not gaining enough weight, we increase the risk of prematurity, right? Um, but again, um, I have oftentimes told patients that um, in this weight class range that as long as you're getting adequate nutrition, which we know may not be the case if they're not eating healthfully, as long as you, your baby is growing appropriately and you're not having any other problems, it's okay if you don't gain weight, in my, in my opinion. This is my personal opinion. And so far those patients have done very, very well. Because again, I think it's really hard, even for our normal weight patients, it is really hard to say, okay, I'm gonna eat this so that in 20 weeks, I'm not gonna, you know, or 40 weeks, I'm not going to have gained too much, especially when you're dealing with a, a different hormonal milieu. Now again, so a lot of the complications that we worry about, right, with the obese pregnant patient or the obese surgical patient is imaging monitoring, it's challenging for nursing, it's challenging for staff, 
There are definitely um, indirect and direct fetal effects, metabolic disease that goes along with obesity, and um, the risk for hypoventilation and obstructive sleep apnea. But I'm going to argue, too, that, you know, these are things that we know go along with it. It's going to be a lot harder to control, but we can plan for. These are things that are just absolutely, you know, it's, it's kind of our problem. It's not as much of the patient's problem. Does that make sense? It's a technological challenge for us that we are charged to meet. It is what it is. We're going to have to deal with it. So let's come up with some strategies to do so. So again, it's a pretty long list of coexisting disease that's associated with having a high BMI. Obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, we can screen for that. We can treat it with a CPAP machine. The challenge is getting people to go, right? Chronic hypertension, a lot of people have that. We can work with that. Um, pulmonary hypertension, this does, this does occur in the morbidly obese patients just because there's such an increased workload of the heart. Um, but again, we can refer our patients and come up with um, uh, multidisciplinary strategies to take care of them well. One thing I really want you to focus on, though, of course, is pulmonary embolism. Um, the risk of a, a, a vascular thromboembolic event is much higher um, in patients who are obese, uh, and especially in pregnancy. Now, again, this is a little older of a study. We're talking, it goes, it spans from late 80s to 2002 that I pulled from up to date. Um, and again, when they're looking at a variety of antepartum, interpartum, and postpartum risks and looking at the adjusted risk factor for moderate obesity, um, here's what they found. So the things that were statistically um, significant were obesity led to an increased risk for preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia, diabetes, a risk of being induced, induction of labor. Whether it's for an indicated reason or not is a little bit debatable. C-section, shoulder dystocia, wound infection, and wound dehiscence. The rest is, you know, less, less clear. But notice, these are um, really essentially odds ratios which is kind of like talking about relative risk. It is not absolute risk. And these things, yes, while higher, if you look at the actual incidence in the population, it's, it's not like a majority of your obese patients are going to have these problems, right? It's really the opposite. So we just need to keep that in mind. Yes, we should look for these problems and plan for them. But um, let's not assume that just because somebody's obese that they're doomed for, 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 um, for badness. This, is, this imaging um, in pregnancy, especially, um, or with obesity, is truly a challenge, though. I think our technologic advances have helped us quite a bit, um, but even something as simple as an x-ray. This is a portable chest x-ray of somebody who's morbidly obese. I think I can see one costophrenic angle here. Who knows what's going on over here? Here's the heart shadow. But when we look at um, detection of abnormalities with ultrasound, um, in a study by Jody Dash at um, Southwestern, she showed very elegantly that um, as BMI goes up along these bars, that no matter who's doing the ultrasound, whether it's just a routine ultrasound or one at the bedside, a targeted ultrasound looking for abnormalities, or a targeted ultrasound by, um, with another risk factor. So we are really looking for something abnormal. As BMI goes up, detection rate goes down. Um, and that, that, that has implications for your patients when you're counseling them. I mean, I've absolutely had those conversations with patients saying, you know, I see that your baby's there. I can see that your baby's moving. I can't see the details well. So you just need to be prepared for that. We will see how your baby's doing after the baby's born. Um, as far as, so, so that's imaging, right? So what about other modalities of screening? Um, when we're talking about screening for the pregnant patient, again, the nuchal translucency, um, when we're only talking about the uh, screening for the risk of Down syndrome, um, the rate of failure goes up with increasing class of obesity. Of course, it, it relies on that good um, imaging. Again, same thing with the first trimester screen. Second trimester screen, um, again, the rate goes down significantly, anywhere from uh, 67 to 71% detection rate with a false positive rate, trisomy 18 can be um, lower. Um, now, there are some weight-based adjustments that can be done here when you specify somebody's BMI, especially when you're talking about the serum analytes, but a, a five-pound discrepancy can re alter the results from negative to positive and up to 9% of women. So you just have to factor that in. So um, when you're counseling your patients about, you know, a lot of patients come in, I don't know about here, but a lot of patients come in saying, yeah, I'm here for my first trimester screen, and they expect us to get it every time and that the results are going to be accurate. Oh, well, or, you know, you see something on level two ultrasound, they say, well, my first trimester screen was fine. They said I don't have a problem. Well, it's a screening test, not a, not a diagnostic test. Um, even cell-free fetal DNA that has better sensitivity and specificity definitely has um, a rate of failure 
uh, of about 0.6% and a maternal weight of 60 kilograms, which goes up to 3% at 100 kilograms and 23.7% if, if somebody's over 110 kilograms. Why? Um, this test relies on having a fraction of the cell-free fetal DNA in the mom's bloodstream that is fetal, right? And that fraction, how much is fetal and how much is maternal, changes. It's much more likely that you're going to have a low fetal fraction when somebody's obese. Um, so it can result in um, an ineffective test. And what's more concerning is that when you get a false negative, um, um, yeah, or, you know, again, one of the things that comes out with this um, cell-free fetal DNA test is you'll get something that says it's an undeterminate, indeterminate test where you don't have a good cell-free fetal DNA fraction. There's a higher proportion of those babies that come back with that result that actually have an abnormality. Um, and again, more concerning again are the false negatives. So what are some of the other risks? Okay, so we've already talked about how screening is a little harder in the obese patient, but guess what? We have the catch-22 that anomalies are also more frequent. So this can be as simple as a cardiac anomaly, um, neural tube defect, um, and other anomalies that you can't see, certainly macrosomia. Um, but this may also be associated with increased gestational weight gain, so it's very important to distinguish between the two. Uh, shoulder dystocia, miscarriage during tree during death, and operative delivery. So, again, we've talked a little bit about um, interventions for weight management and obesity, but now what, what happens when we apply that to pregnancy, right? So we can either take uh, this study um, that was published in the British uh, Medical Journal looked at diet, a mixed approach using diet, exercise, lifestyle changes, and all methods. And interestingly, you know, he, again, this side of this um, uh, scatter plot, this is a nice meta-analysis, um, shows that for a majority of things, such as preeclampsia, diabetes, hypertension, preterm birth, C-section, induction, and postpartum hemorrhage, we're all, for the most part, other than induction of labor, we're all improved by interventions for the most part. Um, I think the things that didn't, that fell out, but they weren't terribly, uh, statistic, I can't even say it, statistically significant, were physical, physical activity alone, which had a slightly increased risk for um, uh, complications, um, and postpartum hemorrhage, and induction, rather. Induction of labor, if you're obese, you're still more at risk for getting induced, even if you have a dietary intervention. So, um, so why does this all affect the baby? I think one of the things to think about is that, you know, we have this wonderful hypothesis proposed by David Barker. He was actually looking at um, women who were exposed to famine conditions and babies that were born very, very small that later in life had an increased propensity to um, have cardiovascular disease. But now this has been applied to a lot of other settings, including um, tobacco use, obesity, um, uh, hyperlipidemia. And some of the things that go along with um, having extreme obesity is there tends to be an increased risk for inflammation, overgrowth, and hormonal imbalance. Um, and again, we've mentioned before in these studies and in others that have shown that obesity, as even though we like to think that most of our patients can be healthy, um, compared to somebody who is of normal weight, people who are obese have an increased risk for earlier maternal cardiovascular death. And have also shown that there's an increased risk of cardiovascular death in adult offspring of women who were previously obese while pregnant. So this all goes to the, again, the fetal origin of adult disease. Things that happen to you in utero can change the, um, the trajectory, your health trajectory later in life. Um, so what are some of these other childhood risks that have been associated with maternal obesity as, as complications for, for the kids? Um, again, we've already mentioned infant mortality, um, and this does tend to go up a little bit, depending on um, the BMI. Um, All-cause admissions to the hospital by age five goes up by a factor of 48%. Obesity, again. Now, this one, interestingly, I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, when they're looking at different ages, this doesn't change too much. So it's either you are or you aren't, but it's about a two-fold increase. Asthma, wheezing, and neurodevelopment. So um, interestingly, um, the researchers found a surprising score that when they look at Bailey 3 scores, that babies born to moms who are obese have an accelerated development of cognition and language skills up to six months, and then it decelerates compared to their peers by 18 months. So again, is this something that's purely nature and nurture? Not sure, but I thought it was very interesting. Um, there is some uh, suggestion too that there's a feed-forward cycle in the inf inflammatory responses that occur when 
mom is obese, leads to hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, increased fetal glucose and intolerance, predisposes to earlier childhood obesity, which leads to adult obesity, and all of this um, increases the oxidative stress and uh, inflammation and cell transformation that can lead to tumorigenesis as well. Uh, and this has been shown specifically in um, girls who are born to moms who are obese tend to have an increased risk, for example, for breast cancer. So it has an impact. So again, so one thing that's important to think of though is again, just like most things in medicine and in, in uh, biological samples, um, we really like to be in homeostasis and our, our bodies are designed to live within a fairly narrow range of weight um, to really thrive, not just survive, but to thrive. So we notice that um, the odds ratio for death in the offspring, while well, we've been talking here today about high BMI and it you know, definitely goes up, and then there's this beautiful um, you know, decreased risk when you're really in the normal range here, this little V, but also if, you're, if the mom is too thin, then there's also that increased risk. So again, not, not good to be too skinny, but not good to be um, overweight either. So what also happens with the moms? Let's focus one more time on the maternal risks. Um, there are respiratory changes when somebody has a, a very large size. There's an increased risk for hypoventilation. It's not uncommon for an awake um, uh, CO2 to be greater than 45 millimeters of mercury. Patients have to work harder. There's a risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, I've got a really beautiful slide here about the, the glottis. Um, you got to think that, again, one of the reasons why there's increased work is there's decreased compliance in the chest wall. You actually literally have more weight to the chest in order to breathe. Um, all of this can lead to increased pulmonary vascular resistance, especially if there's hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension can lead to core pulmonale in the most extreme cases. And there is a risk of post-operative and anesthetic respiratory failure, especially with the use of narcotics post-operatively. Now, not in the OB literature, thankfully, but um, I have seen uh, case reports where um, somebody has gone in who um, had a surgical intervention, was sent to the PACU, and later died because they were given a dose of a narcotic and nobody monitored them well. So this really argues for uh, close monitoring and maybe step-down unit for some of these uh, folks postpartum or post-surgery. So again, I mentioned too, there's an increased risk for obstructive sleep apnea. These are two MRI uh, studies of the airway in somebody who's of a normal BMI and somebody who's um, not of normal BMI, clearly, and is overweight and who has some apnea, sleep apnea. And notice how much narrower these spaces are, even while awake. And so if you think too that then you get relaxed, you get slack, this tongue falls back into the airway, you're gonna have snoring, all the symptoms associated with um, obstructive sleep apnea. So it's really important that as we go in to take care of these patients, especially for per performing surgery, that we respect that airway. Um, again, consider in, uh, intermediate care immediately postoperatively, but also take an early history of snoring, apneas, um, daytime sleepiness, all of those things that go along with obstructive sleep apnea and refer your patients. If, and again, I would argue too that um, uh, it's really hard to get people to go do a sleep study, especially people who already have kids or who are busy or do, who have difficult access to care. But even if you can get one or two patients to go, they can actually really impact their, um, their lives if they're willing to wear that CPAP. And I do think that um, you know, there's a really good argument to try to lobby for more in-hospital uh, sleep studies. And I would actually also argue too, again, if, especially if you have a, uh, somebody who's very comfortable and familiar with placing a CPAP or a BiPAP, if you have somebody who's post-operative and they're having any kind of sleep apneas, it's okay to um, consider CPAP or BiPAP. I'd have a low threshold to use that in a post-operative patient if they need it to help them uh, breathe post-operatively. Um, and it's very, very, very important to include your anesthesia partners early in the care of um, these patients, whether it's just for labor, whether it's for, you know, because they're going to be placing the epidurals, or whether it's for um, general anesthesia. So in the anesthesia literature, it's, it's um, been shown that in especially extremely obese patients, there is up to a 33% incidence of difficult intubation. Um, patients oftentimes have to be placed in a very ramped up position. You can imagine that, you know, what do we want to do as, as OBs when we're doing a C-section or hysterectomy? We want to tape up that panis, right? If you've got a large panis, large pendulous breasts, where does that weight go? It goes to their chest, which makes it even harder for them to ventilate, right? Um, so some patients can't even tolerate it. So it's important to use some um, individualized care when you're thinking about how you're positioning your patient and your surgical approach. Um, and in some patients, they may actually have to perform an awake fiber optic intubation because they, they can't actually ventilate 
uh, patients very well. But if you have a, a, a good anesthesiologist who's willing to work with the patient, I think that's a, a, good, um, a good planning beforehand. Um, again, with epidural analgesia, there's a, uh, an estimated 17% incidence of failure. Now, about 20 years ago, that incidence was reported as high as 44%. So we've gotten better. Um, again, I think you've all experienced this. For your patient who's got a BMI of 70, how easy was it for the anesthesiologist to get in a spinal epidural? Take about an hour, two, did they try? Some people who might not try, but it takes a longer time and it can be more difficult to place the catheter. Um, but interestingly, in the most recent literature, you know, we, um, when you think about difficult um, spinal placements or difficult epidural placements, we always worry about spinal headache. The actual incidence of spinal headache was not increased in um, a morbidly obese population. Um, monitoring the baby can be harder sometimes. Um, we always worry about this. I've had some nurses actually just argue with me, I can't, I can't monitor the baby, you need to go do a C-section right now. Well, that's not an indication for a C-section in and of itself. You know, we can do intermittent monitoring, right? That's still within the standard of care. It's not common. But I found, again, depending on your patient, if you can sit them up in a high Fowler's position, sometimes you can actually find the baby better. If they have a panis that falls down, you can find the baby from above. Um, I have used a large towel to stabilize the external fetal monitor. You know how your nurses have all those magic tricks, like they can roll up a washcloth and put the monitor on? You can use a towel. It, maybe, you know, maybe you need a bigger, a bigger towel, not just a washcloth. Uh, at times, I've actually doubled the belts together in order to avoid um, a tourniquet effect in the skin, because that's really uncomfortable, to, uncomfortable for patients. They will not sit still. Um, more recently, our hospital has acquired some belts that aren't just a thin belt, but it's almost like five belts sewn together. It's like the, they just didn't have the machine cut them. It's awesome. So it makes more like a, a girdle. It's much more comfortable for patients who otherwise have a lot of skin folds, and it'll keep the monitors on a little better. Um, of course, if you, have, if you have somebody who has got ruptured membranes, you can place internal monitors. Um, not always easy to do either. Um, and there are some monitors that have been developed, um, not, always, not necessarily for fetal heart rate, but some purport to do so, like this um, Monica AN24 monitor. It works by using a electromyograph to look at the uterine electrical activity and changes that electrical activity into a wave that's very similar to what we're used to seeing on a um, tocodynamometer. And uh, it actually, um, again, I've participated in some of these studies too. You actually can monitor a patient with morbid obesity better with one of these monitors um, as far as contractile activity. Um, some of these monitors too, some of the people who are developing these, you notice how there's multiple monitors here? You can imagine that if we can get the uh, external um, uh, cardiac monitor like this as well, you can almost triangulate the fetal heart better than if you just had a single monitor. So again, remember I mentioned that there's an increased risk for induction for patients who are obese? It's not always clearly medically indicated. So just remember, just because somebody is obese is not an indication for induction. If I, if I have only one take home message, that is it. That is not the indication for induction. If they've got preeclampsia, yes. If they've got chronic hypertension, sure. Um, diabetic, not controlled, absolutely. Um, but it's not always clearly medically indicated. And for these women, uh, you know, again, because of the surgical risks, it is equally, um, you know, even all the more important to try to give them every opportunity to have a vaginal, a safe vaginal delivery. Um, why? Again, you know, the, it is very clearly documented that the wound complication rate following cesarean delivery goes up as somebody's BMI goes up. And this one is a really hard one to combat. So um, I'll talk a minute about antibiotic usage. You know, you need a higher dose of antibiotics now for somebody who's got a high BMI. But even when um, researchers have looked at the concentration of the antibiotic in the adipose tissue, it's really hard to get to that level that we think will really be microbicidal. Um, Use of things like an Alexis O-ring retractor. When we're talking about general surgery and things like appendectomy, there has been some evidence that using an O-ring retractor reduces uh, postoperative wound complications. But uh, again, I participated in a, in a study that was uh, recently presented at SMFM. We used it in pregnant patients. And in the one group that had the most infections, yes, we used the Alexis O-ring retractor, but it was obese, obese patients, and it didn't, it didn't change that aspect of it. It can still be a very useful tool, though. Um, High BMI is also associated with an increased risk of vertical skin incision, higher blood loss in some studies, not in others, and lower rates of using subcuticular closures. So, you know, again, some of this is preference, some of it 
the data is, you know, iffy about whether one is better than the other, but there are certain things that still, uh, when it comes to patient preference, may, uh, things like not having a vertical skin incision. I've had some obese patients say, I'm not getting in a bikini anytime soon, that's fine, do what you need to do. I've had others who say, no, I really would prefer to have a low transverse um, fan and still skin incision. Or coming back for staple removal, yeah, that can be painful for some patients. Um, or if you think you're going to have loss to follow up, maybe better to use a subcuticular closure. Um, again, I've already mentioned the dosing of antibiotics. Very important to make sure that according to the most recent guidelines, you're um, using an appropriate dose. Um, what about your surgical approach? Does anybody have a preference? What do you guys do here? Fan and steel? Midline? Yeah? Some people are saying I don't. No. <laughs> No, yeah, so the data is really mixed. I mean, if you look at one study, they say fan and steel is better. You look at another study, they say, no, no, we have a decreased risk of wound complications with a vertical incision. Um, my concerns about this, again, um, are that there's no study that accounts for individual body shape, the integrity of the skin. Um, there are different people who have different expertise in different uh, arenas. And again, it likely requires an individualized approach. Your landmarks are, are altered. So, I remember when I was training, you know, I'd heard about the, somebody who had a very large panis, which incidentally can be graded. You pull down the panis, right, so that you can find your landmarks a little better, because the last thing you want to do is try to do a fan and steel incision from the top of the panis and just go through the panis, right? So that's happened. I have a colleague who was doing a bilateral tubal ligation on a postpartum patient with a BMI of about 60, and he, he told me the next day, I came on for him, and he's like, oh gosh, that was the worst thing ever. He, had, he was going, you know, getting in through the adipose tissue, and all of a sudden he arrived from the umbilicus to the symphysis pubis. So he had, you know, again, it, it, your, your body um, structures change significantly, so you have to be very careful about how you're going. Um, but interestingly, uh, again, if you notice, um, your patients are a little bit different. If you think back to that picture where people had different um, percentages of body fat at the same BMI, people are shaped differently. So there are some people who, when you lie them down on the operating table, that portion underneath where you would do a fan and steel incision is nice and thin. You can get there quickly. You know you're going to get to the lower uterine segment. Whereas if you were to do a, a, a vertical, potentially peri-umbilical incision, uh, you might get to the fundus only and then have to do a fundal hysterotomy, which has its own risk factors when you're, you know, thinking about future pregnancies, right? Um, there are other patients who, for example, I think one of the worst wound um, complications that I've ever seen, that was the hardest one to treat, was a patient who had had a fan and steel incision attempted. They had taped up her belly, but then when, her, when everything was taped up, the incision ended up on the underside of her panis. So not right above the symphysis pubis, but it ended up on the other side. And when her wound got infected, she came in, um, and every time we tried to do wet to dry dressings, they would just fall out the minute she would stand up. Why? Because it was, you know, open to gravity. It was downward pointing. We ended up putting a wound back on her, and she did really, really well. Um, so I don't think it's all or none. I think you can certainly do some different things. There are also some nice documented cases of doing a higher um, uh, horizontal skin incision. So you're really aiming still for the lower segment of the uterus, but maybe you place your incision a little higher so that you uh, reach the appropriate landmark. Um, now the only other thing I'll say about abdominal taping is you do have to be careful. We've already mentioned the issues with um, respiratory uh, problems. Some patients cannot tolerate that, so I'll take a very individualized approach. Um, other techniques that have been shown to work or not to work, um, subcutaneous reapproximation of the adipose tissue has been associated with a lower rate of wound seroma and breakdown, not infection necessarily, but things like drains, not necessarily effective um, at improving wound heal healing or reducing infection. And again, there, the data regarding use of subcuticular sutures or staples is very, very mixed. Is it, do you all have a preference here? I know some colleagues are like, ooh, if their BMI is over 40, I'm stapling because if we have a wound breakdown, I want to be able to access it easily. I've got other colleagues who say, nope, I'm going to use subcuticular sutures because the skin is going to be closed. She's going to have a lower risk of wound breakdown. And really, when you look at the data, it kind of depends on what study you read. Patient preferences. I personally, I use subcuticular sutures. I feel like my patients prefer it. I've had good success. But again, a lot of it, I think, still comes down to how patients are controlling their diabetes, how well they're taking care of their wound when they get home. Um, and again, an appropriate prep uh, before surgery. Um, 
Okay, so we've talked about avoiding surgery. What about patients who want to come in and VBAC? Y'all do VBACs here? Yeah. Okay, so again, I've had nurses just wring their hands about, oh, I don't feel comfortable with this. And, and you, have to, you have to respect the fact that if you do have somebody who's morbidly obese and you do have that emergency, right, you do have to plan for that, right? Um, some of these patients are not easy to move and you need increased care and you have to be able to monitor. But when we talk about pa patients who attempt vaginal birth, the success rate does go down a little bit with um, increasing body mass index. Uh, this is also the case if people have an excessive weight gain, but this is really helpful if you have a patient come to you saying, I really want a trial of labor, I had my C-section, it was really hard to recover from. When you're using that MFMU formula, do you, have you used that before, calculating somebody's potential success, chances of success for the residents? Do you all know about that? Great. You can talk to them and say, here's your expected success rate, doesn't take away the risks of rupture, but also, don't gain more than the IOM recommendations to improve your chances of success. And sometimes that can be really motivating for patients. Um, and again, the big one to think about when we're talking about maternal <coughs> risk is to really pay attention to their risk for thromboembolism. Um, this is a slide um, that I've pulled from the most recent um, American College of Chest Physicians and American College of Surgeons um, guidelines for prophylaxis against VTE in pregnancy. Um, and this is actually their, their uh, table of major and minor risk factors. So again, if you have one of these major risk factors, your odds ratio of having a, a PE or a DVT is over six or over three. Um, and then if you have two or more of these minor risk factors, then it goes over six when combined. Uh, and look, BMI of greater than 30. It's like most of our patients, right? That's one minor risk factor. Postpartum hemorrhage, multiple pregnancy, preeclampsia growth restriction. So a lot of our pregnant patients, we've actually recently re, you know, looked again at our um, prophylaxis guidelines, and when you really look at the modern guidelines, and if you look at what they're doing in Britain, a huge number of patients in the post-operative period really meet criteria now for thromboprophylaxis, of course, unless they're having active bleeding or have a clear contraindication. So again, other care strategies that can help you, especially in the OR, because really we want to take care of both of these uh, patients uh, with good results. Um, I mentioned before to start the discussion and counseling, a discussion, not just counseling, um, at the initial visit when you see somebody, and it needs to start as a dialogue, not just counseling. So um, this quote up top was from a, um, uh, a blog that I saw, that it's not the word. There's a lot of people who say, just call me fat, it's descriptive. And it's not the word that's the bad thing. It's not obese that's the bad thing. It's the intent behind it and the perception that people get. And patients have widely variable feelings about their weight. Um, and er you know, again, these are my beliefs that every patient, regardless of weight, deserves advice about healthy eating, appropriate weight gain, attention to nutritional deficits, appropriate weight loss in some cases. And every patient deserves clear and biased discussion of risks and concerns. Um, there is a model to help us with this, so for those, um, for those of us who may still be struggling with how do I approach this patient or, oh, I don't feel comfortable with this or it's really hard for me to let go of that feeling that, you know, I, I know I'm biased and that's how it's going to be, but um, this is a model that has been shown to um, help people, help health, 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 health care providers with counseling to engage the patient um, better, and it's the RESPECT model. Um, again, the whole goal is to establish rapport, <coughs> make sure you have appropriate equipment and an environment that supports having patients who are heavier. If all of your waiting room chairs are small and you've got a patient who weighs 400 pounds, they're not going to have a place to sit down, that is a um, nonverbal message that they're unwelcome, right? Um, they have to feel safe. Their care should be private, just like anybody else's, so they're not the person you talk about at the board like, oh my gosh, she's got you know, the BMI 500. Um, and they should be encouraged. If they're doing something that is a healthy behavior, they're not going to lose weight overnight, but encourage them. Great. And if you use caring and compassion, that's going to be a lot easier. And you do have to be tactful. Again, I, I, I will tell you that even though, you know, most of the time I feel very comfortable working with very heavy patients. I've recently had a patient in ultrasound, and she was a younger patient. She's somebody who, again, as ultrasound, as a, a consultant, I don't always meet these patients beforehand. And I was, I was scanning behind the sonographer, and I couldn't see a body part, but I knew, hey, if I can just get right over here, I can see. I had to ask her to lift her pants, and just my simple act of asking her made her feel very uncomfortable. And usually that's not a big issue. I've had a lot of patients who don't feel bad, but, um, um, but I needed her help. 
Um, it's important to understand that sometimes the panis that can weigh anywhere from, like when we were talking about paniculectomies, when people actually do the surgical removal, they can weigh anywhere between five to 100 pounds, depending on the weight of the individual and the size of the panis. Um, which is important. So, so again, kind of, which leads into my thinking that you need to have anticipatory plans of care. You need to work with your staff. Um, again, not just with the patient. Um, you definitely need to look for any comorbidities that will certainly aid um, your consultants, like your anesthesiologist. Again, I've mentioned adequate equipment and resources and early consultation with uh, providers, but other ancillary services can be really, really helpful. So um, things like a physical therapist, occupational therapist, there are a lot of patients who are fine when they're, um, maybe when they're pregnant or when they're walking around in their usual lives, but once they've had that surgery, I had one patient, for example, tell me, I've had my surgery, I cannot clean myself after I have a bowel movement because I'm in so much pain I can't twist. That is an important risk factor for a wound infection and, and just for um, skin breakdown. Um, so getting a physical therapist or an occupational therapist in the mix can help them with mobility, can help them with transfers, they can help them with using extenders. So there are some fantastic extenders that can be provided or um, that you can buy at a pharmacy, for example, that will help people reach under their pants to clean, um, that will help them uh, clean themselves after using the toilet. Um, and again, getting wound, wound care staff involved early and support groups for these patients can be very, very helpful. Um, Again, it is absolutely okay if you are in a facility, and it sounds like you're very well equipped here with appropriate sized beds that can tolerate patients who are over 600 pounds, things like that. But we've had referrals to our facility from places where they just don't have a bed that will support that patient, or they do not have the ancillary staff that can help them with somebody of, of a larger size. It's okay to ask for a transfer to facility with MFM support or um, adequate um, supplies to help you and to manage the risk appropriately. One size does not fit all. I love this slide because again, it shows the difference between equality. You can give everybody the equal resources when that's such a great result, right? Or you can give, you know, some people a lot of resources, some people a few resources, and some people don't really need so many resources, but guess what? Guess what? Everybody gets a good outcome in the end, and that's okay. Um, some other special equipment that you might need that can help you. I mentioned that sometimes patients can be very hard to transfer. This can be very, very helpful. So a lot of times we will actually have an air mattress for transfers. We'll place it on the labor bed in the event. For example, we have that patient who's trying for a vaginal birth after C-section. <laughs> Table extenders to help um, extend the size. A panis retractor. So this is a really, you've all done tape, I'm sure, taped up the abdomen. This is a Traxi paniculus retractor. Um, it's actually a very large piece of tape that fits over the abdomen and you pull up and it uh, secures at the, at the chest. And it is actually very effective and very easy to place. Um, there are some facilities, especially those that deal with bariatric surgery that have developed limb and body slings. And this can be a formal sling where you have a, a device that can lift patients or you can even use a sheet to help retract legs. Um, and this can be very important because remember these slings can help act as a lever. I've mentioned that a pants can be 100 pounds or more. Um, if, if, it's interesting to notice that the OSHA, you know, the Safety and Health um, Occupation Group um, that looks at safety in the workplace has said that no one individual should be lifting more than 35 pounds. So that can be an arm. That's less than a leg in some of these patients. So you can imagine if you really have that patient who is attempting a vaginal delivery and you're trying to give um, leg retraction, Sometimes you also have to retract the skin around the, around the um, legs and the vagina. You need help, and so you have to make sure that you've got an adequate nursing staff to take care of those patients. Um, I've already mentioned um, some of the long-handled brushes and toiletries. Um, uh, the disposable ring retractors for surgery, I have found very useful for some of these big patients. Now, at times when you place these retractors, they, what they do is they open up, once you roll them down, they open up and expose the um, abdomen a little bit. They're adjustable. You can notice that they're, they can um, accommodate a wide depth and they come in of various sizes. Sometimes I still have to use an additional retractor, metal retractor, but it does hold a significant amount of the bulk or weight available if you don't have a bunch of medical students who are doing the retracting for you. Um, so once you get out into the, into the world. Um, and again, I've already mentioned this too about having adequate personnel. Um, I'm gonna hold on the patient history because again, I've heard some stories about folks here that absolutely match this kind of description. Um, this was a patient who got transferred to us who ultimately had a BMI of 90. Um, we could not see anything on ultrasound. We assumed she had an IUFD at one point. She was severely preeclamptic, um, had all the symptoms, all the worsening um, stuff. We ended up counseling her about non-intervention, 
we're going to deliver you. You need to be delivered. We don't think, you know, we think you, we can't find a heartbeat, even with ultrasound and Doppler. Let's go for a vaginal delivery. Let's not intervene surgically unless you absolutely need it. Sure enough, she ended up having a, um, a live born infant with APGARs of two and four. So that tells you, I mean, we were using the most advanced ultrasound with penetration, optimized, could not see a heartbeat. Um, again, she had significant edema, which even made the imaging worse. Um, but this baby also had anomalies, ambiguous genitalia, and ultimately died within two days. She had, ultimately did very, very well. Uh, but this was a patient who was so big, she, had to be, she couldn't even be life flighted because she was too big for the helicopter, so she had to come by ground ambulance. Um, and uh, we were able to discharge her home on um, post uh, postpartum day two. So questions. That's a lot of stuff. Again, hopefully I've given you some insight to the scope, some tips. Again, I think you probably have just as many tips as I do. But I'd absolutely welcome questions. Hopefully I haven't demoralized you. <laughs> I've, I've always been interested in seeing this change since you showed the 1988 data and increasing obese society. We, we tend to see two groups, those that are you don't like because I'm fat, you don't mm -hmm. need to be my friend, and others that don't try to lose weight just because they think they can't lose weight. Right. Is there any data saying what the propensity of the rationalizations are or not? The propensity of the rationalizations, I think they're both, I think, yeah, there is data about like what motivates people to lose weight um, and what sustains the weight loss, but it's really interesting. There is uh, one of the more recent studies that I've seen has shown that, um, again, if people are engaging in a lot of negative self-talk, so that group of people who are just like, I can't do it, it's terrible, those are the people who are less likely to, to lose weight. It's those people who somehow finally get a little, like, you know, a little bit of acceptance, like, I'm okay with who I am, I've got this plan, I'm going to do it, it's okay, I'm just going to have to live with myself like I am right now. Those are the people who are really successful. Like there's, but you get too accepting, like, well, this is what I am, you know, this is how I am, this is how it's going to be. You know, there's a, there, I think there's a fine line, it's a little bit of a... Um, uh, gradation there, but, but there clearly is some evidence that you know people have to be accepting of themselves before they can ever get motivated enough to lose weight. So it's kind of that catch-22. If they that's why sometimes again the 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 shaming or oh why haven't you lost weight you know it can actually backfire because then people just get demotivated. It's like well might as well not try then. It's just too hard. I can't do it. And I think one of the things that I've heard from um, other not, not just other patients but from family members too is like you know my doctors keep telling me I need to lose weight nobody has told me how to do it. So I think even we as health professionals really have a hard time, you know. How do I make it work for you, or for you, or for you? It's gonna be different for every individual. There's some people who, you know, and that's why there's such a myriad of, of diet plans out there. What works for one person might not work as well for another. Thank you. Mm -hmm, thank you.